Now we're going to show you uh, some of the most famous mosaics in San Vitale. Uh, these are the mosaics that por portray the Emperor Justinian and the Empress Theodora. And they are placed uh, very close to the altar on either wall of the apse, as you see below the uh, conch of the apse, uh, separated by the three windows that are above the altar. So a little bit of history once again. In, uh, in uh, 539 to 540, Belisarius, uh, Justinian's general, conquered Ravenna for the Byzantine emperor. In 546, Justinian appointed Maximian as the bishop of Ravenna. And as we'll see, there is a portrait of Maximian in the Justinianic mosaic. Now, some people would say, well, it has to be 546. Uh, but some people who have closely examined the mosaic uh, believe that perhaps um, the portrait of uh, Maximian may be inserted in there. Uh, but uh, presumably, uh, this is created between 540. At really has to be. Uh, and then uh, with the change, uh, perhaps, of uh, inserting uh, the new archbishop, uh, that would take us into his, uh, into his reign, so perhaps uh, 548. Justinian was emperor from 527 to 565. He is famous uh, as a lawgiver, the Justinianic Code, and as a patron of architecture, including the churches of Hagia Sophia, uh, Saints Sergius and Bacchus, and the Church of the Holy Apostles. The latter, of course, no longer exists, uh, all in Constantinople. Theodora is a very interesting woman. Um, she was probably born somewhere around 500, but that's a guesstimate. Uh, she died in 548, and she rose from lowly origins to become the wife of Justinian and the empress of the Byzantine emperor. Now, much of what we know of her comes from the writings of her detractors, her enemies. And uh, they consider, well, they consider her not any better than a prostitute. Uh, they always have horrible things to say about her. But we have to consider the source. Uh, today, some people look at there and see her as a strong empress. Um, certainly, we know of some instances where she uh, uh, was very uh, important to Justinian. Uh, it's even been suggested that some of the laws against prostitution in the Justinian Law Code may have been at her instigation to try to wipe out uh, what was uh, very detrimental to women. Why? Okay. She was a showgirl. She was an actress in the uh, circus at the Hippodrome. Uh, and at that time, actresses were expected to perform as prostitutes. So, uh, you know, it's the equivalent of um, the king or the president or someone like that marrying a showgirl. Um, however, that wasn't probably what she chose. Uh, she was probably either, uh, even as a child, perhaps sold to the people who, you know, trained her as a performer or grew into that family. Um, whatever her origins were, she was a very able, courageous and intelligent woman. Uh, you may not agree with everything she does, uh, but she was a force to be reckoned with in the Byzantine Emperor, Empire. Uh, one of the stories about her gives you a suggestion of, uh, I guess you'd say her courage, is in January of 532. There were riots known as the Nike riots or the Nikea riots following the horse races at the Hippodrome. And the mob burnt public buildings, including the old church of Hagia Sophia, which is why Justinian had to build a new church. And they 
called for new emperors. Justinian and his court were about to flee to save their lives when Theodora admonished them to remain. Reputedly, she said, purple makes a lovely shroud. In other words, she would rather die an empress wearing the purple than flee like a craven coward. This course of action and the massacre of the rioters saved Justinian's throne. The riots were quelled and he began rebuilding the city. If they hadn't listened to Theodora, we probably wouldn't have heard of Justinian. You know, he would have been a very uh, short-lived emperor. He wouldn't have had his building projects. Uh, he wouldn't have been able to uh, establish his law code. Theodora had great influence with her husband and has been credited with laws giving women more rights, laws against prostitution, um, into which she had uh, been forced, and laws against the purchase of public offices. She supported the Monophysites. Now, I should explain that. Uh, Monophysitism was another uh, uh, theological belief that was considered to be a heresy by uh, the Orthodox Christians. And uh, you can see that from the, the, the name, they were people who believed that Christ had one nature. And that nature was wholly divine. He may have appeared as a human being, uh, but that was an illusion, uh, that Christ was a divine being. And uh, she is supposed to have protected uh, some of the Monophysites uh, from persecution and who have supported some of them. Now, we're looking at their images in Ravenna. But neither Justinian nor Theodora ever came to Ravenna. And yet, they're present in the Church of San Vitale by the power of their images. I remind you how there was a Roman tradition in the Roman Empire. And of course, the uh, Byzantine Empire is the continuation of the Roman Empire. Um, and there was uh, a tradition that you would Im display imperial portraits in uh, law courts and uh, civic buildings throughout the, uh, the Roman world. So that whoever was the governor, whoever was the judge, uh, would then have the authority of the emperor uh, confirmed by the presence of the emperor within his image. Um, so. We're looking at Justinian uh, and his retinue. Only one figure is labeled, and that is Maximian. In 546, the Emperor Justinian appointed Maximian, or Maximianus, Maximinus, <laughs> with the U on the end to make it Latin, uh, the Bishop of Ravenna, and he became the first Archbishop of Ravenna. Now, he's represented standing uh, next to the emperor with his name prominently displayed, and he is the only one in this uh, mosaic who has his name written out, so you can be sure who he is. And uh, so presumably his mosaic portrait dates from shortly after his Episcopal appointment. And as we said, the local populace was not pleased with a bishop from Constantinople. They wanted a local man, uh, someone from Ravenna. So by having himself placed in this mosaic next to the emperor, it solidifies the bishop's authority. It shows, you know, he's right next to the emperor. Uh, he stands with his new bishop. Now, it is, however, possible that most of the mosaic was actually created slightly earlier, uh, after uh, 540, when the Ostrogoths surrendered Ravenna. Uh, there is an article uh, by the Treadgolds in the Art Bulletin from December 1997 that states that the mosaic materials vary for certain images and suggests that additions and changes were made. The head of Maximian is made of stone tesserae, unlike the glass tesserae of the rest of the figure and most of the mosaic. 
So the Tredgolds argue that the mosaic originally showed Bishop Victor and that his head was replaced by that of his successor, the new Bishop Maximi Maximian, and uh, the inscription was added to uh, identify him and make sure you know who he is. In the center, Justinian is shown wearing a crown and a purple cloak. Uh, he's even given a halo. Uh, is this in recognition of his spiritual authority as the vicar or regent of Christ on earth, uh, God, uh, Christ's rep God's representative on earth as the emperor? Or is it an assertion of his piety? Um, I'm asking questions. I'm not giving you an absolute here. Uh, we'll see that the empress also has a halo. And does this mean she shares his authority? Um, she may have been his backbone <laughs> uh, and a, a close, uh, well, a close counselor, but uh, there's no suggestion that an empress would be a vicar of Christ on earth, so maybe not. Uh, does it suggest her piety? Uh, perhaps. Um, does it suggest in a sense that they have uh, some kind of otherworldly uh, powers? I'll let you think about that. Uh, so Justinian is uh, in the center, he's wearing a crown, he's wearing his purple cloak, and he's carrying a large golden bowl. Now, that bowl has been the subject of several interpretations. Uh, one interpretation, uh, Otto von Simpson suggests that this is a patent, uh, the plate that holds the bread for the mass, and that he is participating in the offertory of the bread and the wine during the mass. However, it's pointed out that there's no bread in this pattern, and so that perhaps he's presenting a gift of a liturgical vessel to the church. And perhaps that's more likely since we don't have the bread. Now, some of the other figures uh, are also identified So look at some of the details, and we can see the Byzantine style. Uh, if you look at the draperies, for example, uh, they are linear. The folds are simply lines. Um, they're very stylized forms. Everybody stands and looks forward, uh, and they're going to be very rigid. But one really interesting thing is you've got this uh, green at the bottom that kind of suggests that maybe it's supposed to be grass. Uh, but the image is so flat that you really don't have a sense of the figure standing on the grass. In fact, um, the feet seem to dangle down, uh, just uh, any old way. And in fact, uh, as you can see, some of the figures uh, have their feet dangling on top of others, almost like they, they're stepping on people's toes. Uh, Although the Archbishop, uh, Maximian, is the only one of Justinian's retinue to bear a name, uh, some of the other figures have been given names. And as you look at this, even though we have something that's very stylized, uh, the features uh, seem to be individualized. There's certainly individual little hairstyles, and some of the features are different. Uh, you can see a man with a double chin, and he looks like he needs to shave and comb his hair. Um, and uh, all of them, though, have these uh, large eyes that uh, stare out at us, make eye contact with us, as it were. Um, but some of these figures uh, have been given suggested names. The figure to Justinian's right uh, on our left as we look at it, is often identified as Belisarius, the general who conquered Ravenna. Uh, the head between Justinian and Maximum, which really does look portrait-like, that's the guy who needs to shave and brush his hair, <laughs> and he has very bushy brows too, um, a little double chin. I mean, these are all sort of portrait characteristics. He has been called Julian Argentarius, uh, who financed the building of the church. He's 
also been called uh, the General John, who is the nephew of uh, the usurper Vitalian. The uh, young man uh, to the uh, our left uh, of Belisarius, Belisarius' is right on the far left in this uh, image, maybe Anastasius, the grandson of the Empress, who was engaged to Belisarius' daughter. The truth is, you know, we don't know. Uh, but there we have our representation of the Emperor and of uh, our Archbishop Maximian. We've already mentioned how he is the only figure with an inscribed name and he may have been inserted. The mosaic solidifies Maximian's authority by showing him next to the Emperor. The mosaic of the Empress Theodora and her retinue um, has a bit more clues to the space that they are in, uh, but they haven't solved all the problems because uh, people do interpret this in different ways. Uh, as you can see, uh, she's standing uh, slightly off center, uh, and she is below the conch of an apse or a niche. Uh, that's, it serves as a kind of visual baldachin or canopy over her head and, and uh, you know, helps to draw our attention to the Empress herself. Uh, and then we have, as you can see, a swags of, uh, of uh, cloth at the ceiling. And uh, to the left of the image, uh, we have a, a courtier opening. It looks like he's pulling back or pushing back uh, a drapery that's tied there. Uh, and we even also have a fountain uh, uh, as you enter in. Now, now, where could she be? That's one of the questions. Um, the Empress is slightly off-center. Although all of the figures face front with large eyes, they do seem to process from the viewer's right to left. And there are two male figures who, pre who presumably are the eunuchs that would accompany the women. Uh, and they could be court courtiers as well. Um, when we look at the figures, we see a frieze of figures. Uh, they all face outward with large staring eyes, better to make eye contact with the viewer. And the clothing of the women particularly is just uh, beautifully decorated with rich colors and uh, patterns, uh, sh shapes that are pro presumably uh, uh, embroidery or weaving patterns and jewels, uh, certainly showing their social status as uh, uh, members of the court of the empress. But as you see, they all have the linear outlines and uh, repeated patterns that seem to flatten the forms. And this, of course, is the Byzantine style. The women do seem to be less individualized than the men. Uh, but there have been some suggestions of uh, who these women might be. Um, this is from the Treadgold Tread article. Uh, the two court ladies may be Antonini and Johannina. Uh, who were mother and daughter. And Antonina was the wife of the General Belisarius and a good friend to the Empress Theodora, so she would be placed close to the Empress. Uh, once again here with this detail, you can see uh, the uh, beautiful decorative patterns uh, on the uh, women's garments. And how you know it, it enriches the mosaic, it makes it uh, uh, extremely beautiful and it also flattens the forms and uh, here we see how, uh, a detail of uh, a hand and you can see all how the uh, different colors are laid in with the different tesserae and how light would reflect from these glass tesserae and uh, because they're not just a flat sheet of glass they would come in at different angles and so you would have this shimmering effect. Unlike the Justinian mosaic this has a detailed setting with a fountain, uh, a niche uh, surmounted by a conch shell that serves as a kind of visual canopy over the empress. Uh, and there is a patterned drapery in the doorway. Despite all the details, people still can't really identify where this might be. It's been called the atrium, or it's been called the narthex leading into the church. 
Uh, is it an outdoor setting? You've got the green grass, you've got the fountain. Uh, and are they entering a building? Uh, is it the Church of San Vitale they're entering? Is it uh, a palace? Um, despite all of the details, it's not represented as a cogent three-dimensional space. So I point to the arch over uh, Theodora's head. Presumably, uh, this is a uh, niche or uh, an apse, uh, a, a, a concave shape behind her uh, with a, a conch shell at the uh, top of it. Uh, the not a real conch shell, a conch shell decoration. Um, but it seems to be flattened. And it, you know, I said behind, but, uh, or above, uh, is she in front of it? Is she within it? Uh, you know, the spatial relationships are not clear. So um, we seem to have a flattened form to frame the empress rather than something that gives us a three-dimensional concave architectural structure. Now, one of the questions is why is the emperor represented in a timeless, immaterial space, golden background, and the empress is placed in a specific area, even if we're not sure where it's supposed to be. Well, of course, we don't know, so we resort to speculation. Uh, one speculation is that this diffuses her presence in the sanctuary of the church. Remember, the mosaic itself is right, right above and near the app, uh, the, right above and near the altar. And women were never permitted in the sanctuary of the church, not even the empress. So it's showing that, oh, I, I, you know, the, the image may be in the apse, but I'm really someplace else. Is that a way to diffuse that? Um, and there's another idea, that it represents a specific ceremonial moment that uh, people would recognize when they uh, look at it. Uh, one interpretation of Justinian and Theodora's actions, where they're bearing a patent and a chalice, is that they are participating in the offertory. Now, I should explain what the offertory is. Um, I know in a lot of churches today, uh, people pass around um, plates or bags, and people are supposed to put their money in it. But that's not what we're talking about. That's kind of the placement in the, uh, the mass. But... Uh, what the offertory was in the early church, and they're still, um, they still do this sometimes during a mass, is when um, the faithful would bring the bread and the wine, they would offer it to the church, and then that would be used, that would be consecrated uh, as the body and blood of Christ. And then it became, of course, ceremonial, and specific people uh, could bring these uh, elements to the priest. Um, you know, sometimes in today's churches it would be an acolyte, uh, and since the 1960s uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, they, some of the churches even allow a woman to bring it. Um, but uh, at any rate, that's been one suggestion um, that Justinian and Theodora are bringing the gifts of bread and wine to the altar to be consecrated. The problem with that interpretation is that a woman would never have been allowed to perform this task. Uh, as I said, uh, in the Catholic Church, they were allowed from the 1960s on, certainly not in the sixth century. Um, or is it uh, just symbolic? She can't really be there, uh, but she's participating. Um, the other idea, of course, is that she's offering a gift, uh, a jeweled chalice uh, to the church. And of course, we don't know whether, when these were put up, whether um, such gifts were actually sent from Constantinople to Ravenna. Uh, we just simply don't know. Whatever the specific moment or place, it's clear that both the emperor and the empress are bearing gifts of liturgical vessels, just as the Magi brought gifts to the Christ child. Um, so here we see an image of the Magi bearing gifts, and uh, they're shown in the mosaics at the hem 
of Theodora's cloak, as though they were embroidered on her cloak. Whatever the specific moment or place, it is clear that both emperor and empress are bearing gifts of liturgical vessels, just as the Magi brought gifts to the Christ child, as represented on Theodora's cloak. Now, the Magi were described by St. Augustine as representing the universal church approaching the heavenly altar. The liturgical vessels and the presence of the imperial mosaics in the apse of the church near the altar are consistent with the Eucharistic theme of the Abraham, Abel, and Melchizedek mosaics on the adjacent walls. <laughs>